Good morning. We start today with general questions. Question number one from Richard Leonard. Thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Police Scotland regarding its estates strategy. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The state strategy is the responsibility of Police Scotland with oversight by the Scottish Police Authority. The Scottish Government is in regular contact with Police Scotland and the SPA on a range of issues. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply? And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he can confirm that Shots Police Station has been removed from the list of stations that may face closure? And if so, what other stations have also been removed from that list? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign off, my understanding from Police Scotland is that the issue around their estates review is still being taken forward by the local divisional commanders, and that includes a uh, divisional commander that's responsible for the police station in Shots. The member also raised the issue back in November uh, last year, and the situation hasn't changed, and where uh, Police Scotland's position is on this matter. Um, they've made it clear that the facility in Shots is too large for their purpose. Um, uh, they would like to see someone else come in and join them in that facility. If that's not possible, to look at having a joint facility somewhere else within Shots in itself. Uh, so it's not about uh, ending any presence in Shots, it's about making sure they've got a facility that's fit for purpose and meets the needs of local policing. And that the uh, Police Scotland will continue to take that work forward in engaging with local communities, including local elected members, uh, to engage in their views around the state's proposals within their own immediate area. Margaret Mitchell. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the criticism about um, the, since the creation of Scott, uh, Police Scotland uh, leading centralisation of policing at the expense of local policing, uh, will the, the Cabinet Secretary now support the abandonment of the closure of local police stations such as Lark Hall and um, that in Hamilton, who play an important role in collecting intelligence at a local level and also at a national level combating uh, serious and organised crime. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member is completely wrong in this issue around the estate review. The police estate has built up over 100 years and Police Scotland are looking at the estate to make sure it's fit for purpose and it reflects the new and emerging demands which they face. It's not about whether it actually diminishes policing. And as uh, Assistant Chief Constable Andy Cowie made it very clear, this is about enhancing the service that they deliver, not doing less in local communities and in making sure the facilities are actually fit for purpose. And I must confess, uh, sign officer, if the member thinks that the best way in which the police can go about is actually collecting intelligence, is about having police stations, then simply the member has no idea about how modern policing is taken forward. Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, does the cabinet secretary agree with me that if Police Scotland feel the, the changing nature of crime and the way in which it's reported means it's necessary and sensible to, to, to change their estate portfolio, they should be able and supported in doing this? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign off. So the work that Police Scotland are taking forward, as I mentioned earlier, is to uh, reflect on the fact that they have a police estate that has evolved over 100 years. The reality is uh, the way in which police stations are used today has dramatically changed than the way in which they were used 100 years ago. I would have thought members in this chamber would welcome the fact that Police Scotland are looking at their estate to make sure they are using it as effectively as possible and in doing so, enhancing the way in which they can deliver local policing, in particular in working in collaboration with a range of other agencies which are absolutely essential in meeting the new and changing nature of uh, crime in our society. And that's exactly what Police Scotland are looking at doing, and they will continue to do that, engaging with local communities, with local divisional commanders, having a key role in the decision-making around any changes to the police estate within their divisions. Thank you. Question two has been withdrawn. Question three, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what its most recent figures are for the uptake of the Young Scot National Entitlement Card. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Young Scot National Entitlement Card is available free of charge to everyone or anybody aged 11 to 25 uh, living in Scotland. As of the 31st of May, there were approximately 655,000 Young Scot cardholders. And of those card holders, 151,000 are aged between 16 to 18 and qualify for concessionary travel on bus, rail and ferry through the Scottish Government's concessionary travel scheme for young people. Pauline McNeill. 
The figures that I obtained from SPICE show that the last figures available were 2009 and that approximately 30% of the population aged 16 to 18 in Scotland held the relevant entitlement card. In view of that, does the Minister not think it's time for a review of the uptake of this card, which seems to be extremely low? Is it not time also for a review for discount travel for young people? The promotion of it is extremely poor. The discounts are confusing and they are restrictive, having to travel off peak and you have to spend more than £12. I think Scotland's young people deserve better investment on that. I hope the Minister will, in time, be able to support my private member's bill on transport discounts for 16 to 18-year-olds. But if not, does the Minister not agree that uh, that age group are entitled to a better promotion of discount travel across the country? Minister. I thank the member for her question. I would disagree slightly in that I think the uptake of it uh, is fairly good. But of course, I'll look at the figures that she says she's obtained from SPICE and where we can work with Young Scotland, who are an excellent organisation, I think, respected across the chamber, to further promote that scheme. Then, of course, I'll look to do that. So wherever we can do that, we certainly will. But the discounts uh, that are provided by the scheme uh, are excellent and do make a, a real difference. Of course, I know about her view in respect to our private members. Bill. In fact, I'm, of course, she knows I met with her uh, and told her that, of course, the government would look uh, with an open mind with uh, any piece of legislation that she chooses to bring forward. Of course, any extension of that scheme would undoubtedly, of course, have to be costed. And therefore, uh, we will no doubt uh, be going back into that period that everybody enjoys as members in this chamber into the spending review. Uh, and therefore, no doubt, our party could put forward proposals uh, on what the cost of that would be. But uh, those proposals would have to be costed um, uh, in, in a very uh, budget that is, is quite constrained. But yes, I will certainly uh, speak to her and, and look to see if the promotion of the concessionary travel scheme for young people can be uh, more visible. And Brian Whittle. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I wonder if uh, uh, the Minister ever con considered encouraging the extension of the use of the uh, Young uh, Scott National Entitlement Card to other areas, such as perhaps uh, access to local facilities? Minister. Some local authorities do choose to tinker with the scheme to allow them uh, access, for example, to local facilities, and that is for local authorities to do that. Uh, we, because, uh, as I say, with the budgetary constraints that we have, of course, look to maximise that budget uh, and use it in a way that uh, benefits uh, the most people. And in terms of the concessionary travel scheme, he might know that we have plans to extend that uh, to modern apprentices uh, under the age of 21. But again, if proposals come forward from opposition parties, uh, if those proposals are costed, uh, then of course uh, we can have uh, a discussion on that. But at the moment, uh, there are uh, the only plans to change the National Concessionary Travel Scheme will be put forward in a consultation, uh, and we will look, of course, to extend them, as I say, to modern apprentices. Question three, Claire, sorry, question four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that products covered by the Conformity European or CE mark that are manufactured or sold in Scotland will continue to meet such standards post-Brexit. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, as we've made clear since the vote to leave the EU last year, maintaining Scotland's membership of, of and access to the single market is the best way to protect our interests. This is a policy we will continue to pursue and we will not accept a position where consumers or businesses in Scotland have inferior rights and protections compared to those in other EU countries. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? The CE marking is recognised worldwide and many consumers across the globe are familiar with the, not familiar with the European economic area recognise um, the confidence that a CE marking on a manufacturer's product can give. It ranges from toys to electrical equipment to smoke alarms. Um, if we find ourselves out with the EEA, how will our manufacturers be able to show compliance with the standards that are recognised throughout the world and will there be additional costs in, in doing so? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Claire McAdams uh, question, uh, sorry, Claire Adamson's question highlights yet another of one of the complexities which surround Brexit and also a yet another benefit that may be lost to Scotland. Uh, as a non-EU state, Scottish manufacturers would likely need to pay an EU broker uh, a fee to obtain the CE marking. And that serves once again as a demonstration of how vital access to the single market is for Scottish businesses 
and consumers. And, presiding officer, we're a few days before the EU starts its negotiations, apparently with uh, the rest of the EU. We have no indication whether consumer protection even features on the agenda of the EU, uh, uh, of the UK government in terms of its discussions with the EU. We don't even yet have the strong and stable government that we were, proposed, we were told we were going to have. And what we are facing, of course, is a shambolic exit. A shexit, and I cleared my throat before I said that, uh, from the EU under the Tory government. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Industry bodies in the UK issue guidelines on EU certification on a sector wide basis. Given this, will the Cabinet Secretary work with his counterparts in the UK government to ensure that this matter is taken forward on a UK wide basis, especially as 65% of Scotland's trade is with the rest of the UK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cabinet yeah, apologies, President. If I couldn't hear the start of Dean Lockhart's question, there was some mumbling from the Labour branches at the time. But uh, in relation to working on these kind of issues with the UK government, of course we'll do. Of course we'll do that. We've done that on many issues. Wherever the interests of Scotland need to be represented, we'll do that by the best means, whatever. And I'm happy to come back to the first part of the question when I find that in the official report to Dean Lockhart. Question number five, Alison Johnson. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to introducing legislation on the installation of CCTV in abattoirs. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has already recommended the installation of CCTV as best practice in the monitoring of animals at the time of killing. I am advised that an estimated 95 per cent, the overwhelming majority of animals, are slaughtered in plants where CCTV has already been installed voluntarily. The Scottish Government does not consider that CCTV by itself prevents welfare failures or secures welfare compliance. We will continue to monitor animal welfare at time of slaughter through the presence of food standards, veterinary and inspection staff in all approved slaughterhouses. And we will consider whether there is a role for the Scottish Government to help industry to produce a set of good practice protocols for the review evaluation and use of CCTV. Alison Johnson. Um, data released under Freedom of Information Law by Food Standards Scotland lists 706 breaches of animal welfare regulations at Scotland's 35 abattoirs. Between May 2015 and January this year, many involving multiple animals, more than a third of these instances were rated as critical non-compliance, meaning they had caused avoidable pain, distress or suffering. I think many consumers would be horrified to learn that they might be supporting businesses where animals haven't been treated with care and respect. Surely the Cabinet Secretary should commit to insisting on 100% CCTV coverage in areas where animals are stunned and killed. And of course, this is not to take away from the importance of veterinary inspections. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scotland has the highest welfare standards at slaughter with strict legal requirements. Uh, and it's important to avoid giving the impression that that's not the case. Uh, the Farm Animal Welfare Committee the experts in this matter have said that CCTV cannot act as a substitute for direct oversight by management or veterinarians. It's important to, uh, to be clear, presiding officer, that of those uh, 706 breaches, the majority, 479, were actually attributable not to the slaughterhouse, as was implied by the questioner, I think, but to on-farm or transport activity. And I would also say that Food Standards Scotland quite rightly take all of these matters extremely seriously indeed, not mentioned by the questioner, uh, but that uh, action has been taken in many of these cases uh, to enforce breaches, as is absolutely correct. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. While it is indeed the case that 95% of slaughterhouses, according to Food Standards Scotland, have CCTV, I would suggest that it's required, it depends where it is, I'd suggest it's required in all areas affecting animal slaughter, from the point of delivery to layerage, layerage itself, race to stunning box, stunning box and point of stunning, roll out from stunning box, hoisting, sticking and bleeding area. So would the Scottish Government, if it will ever consider legislation, factor in CCTV in all of these areas? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the member displays a, an admirable knowledge about the specific details of the process of uh, slaughterhouse, and she is quite right to raise that each of these factors deserve carefully to be considered. And that's why we've already indicated, as I said in my original answer, uh, that we are considering helping the industry produce a set of good practice 
uh, protocols. But it remains the case that the Farm Animal Welfare Committee believes that CCCTV cannot by itself be the solution and is not a substitute for proper management and oversight. Uh, but of course, we will continue to keep these matters carefully under review. Question six, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when its Rural Payments Division will issue advice to the Crofting Commission to determine the sublet crofting application at Viga West Yale Shetland, which was submitted to the Commission on 24th of June 2016. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, the Scottish Government provided the additional information requested by the Crofting Commission on the 8th of June uh, this year. If no further information is required for the sublet crofting application, the Crofting Commission will complete their actions and provide advice on their outcome. Tavis Scott. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for looking into this case, and I'd be grateful if you could tell my constituents um, when, the commission, when the Commission will actually reach a determination on this application, given it's been outstanding from June of last year. And when he introduces his reforms on the Crofting Commission next week, will he, will he ensure that the principle to be followed is that the Crofting Commission should be a body that helps crofters rather than the other way around? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member is absolutely right to raise this individual case, and I can assure him that my officials received a very full answer from the Commission. And I think it's important to say the Commission regret that the case applicant experienced an unfortunate three-month delay between August and November last year, and they have given an explanation for that. And I'm happy if the member wishes to explain, uh, to explain that and to provide it for his constituent. I would say that over the last 12 months, the average time taken for sublets is 12.2 weeks, presiding officer, and this would indicate there's not generally a problem with this process, but I'm sure that the Crofting Commission Chief Executive and Board members will have listened carefully to what Mr Scott has said uh, and ensure that things are, are processed as quickly as possible in future. Question number seven, Edward Mountain. Thank you, presiding officer. I refer members to my register of interest to ask the Scottish Government whether all farmers will receive their 2015 and 2016 subsidy payments by the end of June 2017. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, we completed 99.9% .9 of Pillar 1 payments by the EU deadline of 15th of October and now have only 25 of the 2015 BPS payments still to complete. In relation to Pillar 2 2015 claims, we have now paid over 99% of all rural priorities claims for 2015, along with 98% under the Land Managers Option Scheme, and processed 85% of LFAS 2015 claims. We hope to complete processing the vast majority of outstanding LFAS claims next month. We have repeatedly made clear our determination to make the vast majority of payments by the end of the payment period, and we are doing all we can to meet that goal. Everyone, presiding officer, is working incredibly hard to process the remaining payments. We have addressed a, number of, a small number of known defects which held up some claims, and these are now being progressed. We will continue to provide regular updates and progress across schemes to both the rural economy and the public audit and post-legislative scrutiny committees. Edward Mountain. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that long answer, which effectively said no. We've had the blunt and condemning report on the £180 million cap IT system produced by Fujitsu, a damning report produced by Audit Scotland. We've also been warned that there might be £60 million plus of fines to be paid. Last year, Cabinet Secretary, you gave this Parliament a three short word answer to the problem. We are sorry. In return to me today, can you answer a short three-word question on this omni-shambles? Who's to blame? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know, I, I, I could just answer the, the question asked by the member by using three words in relation to the three propositions he made, and those three, weeds, three words are, you are wrong. You are wrong because the Fujitsu report did not as you say, conclude that the system was broken. On the contrary, as he well knows, presiding officer, the, the Fujitsu report, the technical report, concluded that the system uh, is fundamentally sound uh, and we are sorting the defects. Secondly, he... Well, these are the facts, presiding officer. I know that the opposition aren't very keen on the facts, but here they are. Secondly, the Auditor General recognised that significant progress has been made uh, and thirdly, he is wrong that there will be a £60 million fine 
uh, and we, have, uh, uh, we are absolutely certain that that will not uh, be a figure that we recognise. And I would point out another fact that last year, the Auditor General said that the fines, the penalties would total between 40 and 125 million pounds. That too will not be the case. Therefore, on all three matters, presiding officer, the Conservatives have got their facts wrong. I suggest, I suggest that they have a thorough reading, as I have, of the report. And finally, I pay tribute to the hundreds of staff around this country, uh, most of the offices of which I visited and many of them I've spoken to, that unlike the Tories carping from the sidelines, are working flat out to do the duty that we all want to see of ensuring that farmers and crofters get the money, the support payments to which they're entitled.